I'm Alan Jay. I'm the National Executive Director at COA. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all to this latest edition of Zoom with COA. Arab terrorism in Israel, the dangers posed by a nuclear Iran and judicial reform, featuring former representative of COA in Israel, Dan, MK Dan Luz. That sounds good, Dan. With an introduction by ZOA National President Mort Klein. Uh, we at ZOA hope and pray that all on this call are and remain safe and healthy. I'd like to thank Jackie Schaefer, ZOA Communications Manager, and Dan Pollock for helping to manage uh, this program. <laughs> Before we start, let me just share how we're going to run today's program. All microphones should remain muted for the duration of the program. In a moment, ZOA President Mort Klein will introduce our special guest. We'll speak for approximately 15 to 20 minutes, after which I will moderate Q&A. We will not be monitoring the Zoom chat feature for questions, so please, I'll repeat this, post your questions only to the Q&A area. That's usually located in the middle of your, uh, the bottom middle of your Zoom screen. Uh, it's usually the case that we'll only be able to handle a handful of questions. Preference will be given to questions posed by national board members and donor society members. But please don't be offended if your question is not selected during the program. We'll send unanswered questions through MK Alusa's office, and we'll post the answers to the questions when we post the webinar on our YouTube channel. Uh, before, before he was an MK, Dan and I organized many ZOA webinars. I guarantee that you're going to walk away from this program better informed on several critical issues. Uh, ZOA <laughs> National President Mort Klein requires no special introduction. The child of Holocaust survivors, an economist in three United States administrations, friendly with international figures that most of us only read about in newspapers or see on television. At the 125th anniversary of the Zionist Council held in Basel, Switzerland last November, a gathering of Zionists from across the world, only Mort Klein was singled out for special recognition. Mort is often published in major print media, and he regularly appears on TV and radio. In just the past few weeks, Mort met with senators and congressmen on the Hill, with conservative students at Columbia University, and with Reverend Al Sharpton at his offices in Harlem, all in the pursuit of fearlessly advocating for Israel and the Jewish people. For whatever it's worth, I personally hold that history will record Mort as the greatest Zionist of our generation. To formally introduce our guest speakers, Mort. <laughs> well, thank you, Alan, <clears throat> for that extraordinarily uh, generous and kind introduction. Uh, it's largely a pleasure for me to be introducing our very special guest. I say largely because we regret that he left COA, where he was directing our Israel office and doing a fantastic job. And uh, uh, the Knesset poached him from our uh, from ZOA and, uh, and made him a, a member of Knesset. Uh, uh, Dan Luz is a Canadian who made Aliyah in 2009 at the age of 23. He's a graduate of McGill Law School, uh, possibly the top law school in all of Canada, whose graduates include uh, Erwin Kotler, Mort Zuckerman, and most notably, Leonard Cohen. Did not graduate, but he went to McGill Law one of the great uh, singers and compos uh, composers of our time. <laughs> uh, Dan Luz was a member of the Jerusalem City Council and the uh, Kohelet Forum, which is involved in this uh, judicial reform. Uh, one of his phrases that he likes to use is that he likes to speak truth, even when that truth remains a minority position, fight for his principles, and never fear backlash. And he says this was the theme at ZOA and that that's why he was so comfortable uh, to be part of uh, our, our leadership. Uh, he is uh, speaking out about East Jerusalem Arab areas, which are promoting incitement, funded by Israel. It's a real problem. He is making an issue out of it. And he's a strong proponent of Israeli sovereignty uh, in the, at least areas of Judea and Samaria. He's a member of the Education Absorption and uh, Economy Committee. Uh, he's a member of the Foreign Affairs and Defense Committees. These are very important committees that he's already a member of. And we are uh, really thrilled about uh, Dan Luz. We think he uh, is and is going to be a superstar. Uh, we think is, he'll be a future minister. And I wouldn't be surprised, with God's help, if he's even a future prime minister. He has that much talent and that much integrity and that strong a principled uh, individual. So I present to you a uh, member of Knesset, 
and former head of the ZOA uh, uh, Israel office, Dana Luz. Thank you so much, Mort. Uh, it means a lot to hear these words, uh, especially when they come from you. Uh, I, I uh, want to sign on to everything that Alan said in his introductory remarks uh, about the history uh, of the work that uh, you've been doing for the Jewish people and for Israel. Uh, and I want to also emphasize that, uh, as you said, I'm, a, I'm an alumni of ZOA. I was the Israel director of ZOA, and I always knew how important our work at ZOA was. Uh, but since I became a member of Knesset, uh, this has just become even more critical in my eyes. Uh, I see how important the strong, unapologetic voice coming out of America is, especially in these times uh, where there's a lot of uh, different voices coming out of uh, the Jewish community and of the non-Jewish community in America. It's so important to have a voice that's clearly Zionist, that clearly backs Israel's interests, that always stands by Israel. And so I wanna thank you, Mort, personally, and also the whole staff, uh, Alan, Dan, Jack, Jacqueline that are here, but also the whole staff uh, in, uh, at ZOA. Uh, and uh, thank you very much for your work. Uh, I've been asked to give a little bit of an overview about what has been going on uh, in uh, Israel uh, pretty much since I made it into the Knesset uh, for the last three months uh, with a special focus uh, on the judicial reforms, uh, on the terrorism uh, that has happened and also on Iran, which is, has always been a very big issue and is uh, still uh, a very big issue. Uh, and so I'd be very happy to do that. And I'll just say right now that I'm, I'd be happy to also do that periodically. So if you think that it's a good idea for uh, me to come back and to uh, update about what's happening, then I'll be very happy to do that periodically. Uh, it's been a very tough three months for Israel. It's been a very tough three months, first and foremost, uh, because of the security situation. Uh, it, people tended to connect the security situation with Ramadan uh, as if uh, Ramadan was uh, any sort of justification uh, for killing Jews. I mean, I, I'm a religious person. When I'm religiously, uh, when I'm in a religious holiday, I don't usually go out and kill people. That's not how we practice and cherish God. That definitely is not the right way to cherish God. Uh, and so, but some people thought that that was uh, the reason why uh, the, the security situation was so dire. Uh, but actually, we see that today uh, we've had a reminder that it's not only about Ramadan and it's not only about their religious practice and their fasting and therefore being uh, more uh, tension because when you don't eat, you get mad and things like that. It's not about these all these excuses, which, to be honest, I never believed. Uh, it's, uh, it's something much uh, deeper. Today, we had a terrorist attack in the morning in the Shomron. Uh, thank God. Uh, no one was even injured, no one was killed, no one was injured, but there was an attempted murder. Uh, when, uh, when Jews don't get killed, and, but they're just attempted, it's just an attempted murder, uh, then usually you don't hear about it in the news. So I just want to make it clear, there was an attempted murder of a Jew today. Uh, thank God it didn't uh, succeed, uh, but it happened. And then we also had uh, several rockets. Uh, last time I checked, it was over 20 rockets uh, that were uh, fired from Gaza uh, to Israel uh, today. One person was injured uh, in the, in the in, not from the rocket, but from the shrapnel that came out of, uh, of the Iron Dome. Uh, but still, one person was injured. Uh, hopefully, I, I, I wish him a, a, a speedy recovery, and hopefully that will happen. But one person was injured, and again, we see that it wasn't about the Ramadan. So their newest excuse today is that there's someone that was uh, uh, that, that that died in prison after going on a hunger strike. So because that person went on a hunger strike and died, basically committed suicide, uh, then Israel uh, must pay for it, and the Jewish people must pay for it, and therefore we should kill Jews. That's basically their excuse. But we all know that that's not really the case. We're talking about an old fight. Uh, against the very existence of Israel, about the very presence of Jews in the land of Israel, in our historical homeland, 
And they're always using different excuses to justify why they are uh, using this violence and trying to kill Jews. Uh, but we all know the truth. The truth is that ever since the Jews have started coming back to the land of Israel, uh, maybe not in the beginning, by the way, but ever since uh, Haj Amin al Husseini, the leader of the Palestinian uh, Arabs, uh, at that time in the in the uh, Palestinian territories, right? Palestine is a, is a, is a geographical uh, word. It's not a, a national world. So the whole area was called Palestine. We call it the land of Israel. Uh, the, ever since Haj Amin al Husseini started inciting hatred uh, against the Jews and using excuses like Al Aqsa and all of these things in order to kill Jews, then we've seen that this is happening over and over again. They always use different excuses. But it's something that always happens, uh, and they always look for opportunities uh, to find Israel in a weaker spot in order for them to try and attack us. And that gets me to the second topic, uh, which was very uh, difficult uh, in the last few months. Uh, as you probably know, uh, uh, after being elected the Likud, uh, after establishing the Likud government, uh, the Likud, together with our coalition partners, specifically uh, Tzionut Datit, Religious Zionism of Smotrich and of uh, Simcha Rotman, my very good friends, uh, the Likud, together with the coalition partners, proposed a legislative uh, reform, a legal reform, uh, sorry, a judicial reform, uh, in order to change the balance between the courts. Now, Whenever I explain what the situation right now is in Israel, people don't believe that I'm saying the truth because it's completely ridiculous. Uh, judges basically nominate themselves. They don't, they're not alone in the committee that nominates uh, judges, but they have a veto power there and they always vote as a block and therefore they nominate themselves. This is unique only to Israel. It doesn't exist in any other democracy where there's a veto power to judges and judges nominate themselves. You have other democracies where judges sometimes are part of the process, but it's definitely not the standard. Usually judges are, uh, are nominated by elected officials in order to ensure that they, uh, that, they, that, that they hold values that are dear to the population that, they're, and they, uh, that, they're, uh, that they serve uh, eventually. But here in Israel, judges are elected by judges, uh, again, through that veto power. Legal advisors to a minister can tell the, the, the advisor what he's allowed to do and what he's not allowed to do, and the minister is bound by that, by that opinion. In other words, if in any other country that I know of in the democratic world, including Canada, including the United States, you have legal advisors that are sometimes nominated by the minister himself and that he can fire, but definitely even if that's not the model, uh, they can the, the the minister can always ask for a second legal opinion. He's not bound by the interpretation of the law, which isn't always clear uh, with the, from the that specific legal advisor, which comes from a very again a very clear uh, system that grew him and broomed him. Uh, but in Israel, the ministers are bound by law to listen to uh, the, to the, the the legal advisors to their ministries. And again, a law that wasn't passed by the Knesset, but a law that was decided by the courts who nominate themselves. You're starting to understand this vicious circle of people that nominate themselves, that end up uh, deciding uh, all the different things in the ministries. And not only that, but something absolutely ridiculous is that they can decide not according to what the law says and not according to what there is written in the law, but according to what they see as reasonable or unreasonable now i don't know sometimes i think something is reasonable and my wife thinks differently that uh, we get into an argument but uh, i mean what's reasonable and what's not reasonable is not something that's clear it's something that's subjective and yet these legal advisors who again the minister is forced to listen to their opinion can tell the minister what to do whether it's reasonable or not reasonable. If they think that it's unreasonable, then he cannot do it. If they think it's reasonable, then he's allowed to do it. Now you understand how this whole system is very, very problematic on a democratic level. 
right? The protests that we have right now in Israel against the judicial reforms claim that Israel will be less of a democracy if those reforms pass. But anyone who understands the very basics of democracy, which is how does the, the American constitution start? With the words, we the people, we the people. And that, that is the ABC, that is the very foundation of democracy, the people electing their elected officials who then end up representing them and making decisions. But when you have this system that stops the decision from being implemented without any restraint, I mean, many democracies have judicial review. Many democracies have courts who do sometimes intervene in legislation and these things, but the, the courts are much more restrained than what they are in Israel. And also something else, they're usually based on the constitution that the parliament, the elected officials have passed. That doesn't exist in Israel. And so all of this system is very, very problematic. And those reforms won't make Israel less democratic. They will make Israel much more democratic. Now, all of this is something I very strongly believe in, and we could speak for, about it for an hour, but, uh, but, to, but, but, but to focus on the subject that we've been talking about, I said that it was a very difficult few months, not because of the reforms, because again, I really believe in these reforms. However, the, the protests that happened against the reforms in the last few months in Israel, and I'm speaking freely to you because I know that ZOA is a very dear and pro-Israel uh, uh, organization, and you guys should know what's happening in Israel. The protests have crossed red lines that were never crossed before by any opposition in Israeli history. You've had the leader of the opposition, Yair Lapid, going around the world, telling heads of states how bad those reforms are and how Israel will stop being a democracy after uh, they pass. Now, forget about the fact that that's not true. It's not true. And he's just trying to get people to put pressure on Israel in order to stop those very important reforms from passing. Uh, still, the very fact that the leader of opposition is going around the world and telling them how horrible Israel is and how it won't be a democracy if those reforms pass, when we have a majority and we can pass these reforms, what message does that give to the world? Does that make the world like Israel more or does it make Israel uh, the world uh, like Israel less? Does it help Israel or does it hurt Israel? This is incredibly irresponsible. Now, that's one thing. The other thing, which is even worse, is this trend that we've seen amongst reserve soldiers where they threatened to refuse orders if the reform passed. This is something which was completely unprecedented in Israeli history. And the feeling that we have here in Israel is that there is a min minority in Israel, and we see that in elections, that they're a minority. It's not just me saying that they're a minority. You have a minority in Israel that loses elections, isn't able to get to rule the country. The only time they were able to get some part of power is when Naftali Bennett went from being right wing to being to leading a left wing coalition. And maybe he says he didn't change his ideology, but he was leading a left wing coalition. And only then were they able to get enough people in order to have a coalition. And so they're a minority and they can't get to power, and they understand that the only way they can get the policies that they want advanced is through the courts, through the bureaucracy, and now we see also through threatening to refuse orders in the army. Now, because we care a lot about unity and about the unity of Israel, we said at the end of the last uh, session in the Knesset, the prime minister, Prime Minister Netanyahu said, we will give a chance to negotiations in order to try to get to some sort of agreement that will enable the reforms to pass with less opposition. This is something which we didn't need to do. I have to be frank. We could have passed the reform. We have a majority in the parliament and they could have passed. And to be honest, a lot of people on the right uh, weren't happy when the prime minister decided that. But still, I think it was something that showed how important the unity is to us. And when you compare that to the other side and how they've been uh, threatening with 
uh, refusal and going around the world and saying how horrible we are, you see the contrast between the two sides. But to us, Jewish unity is very, very important. And therefore, we're giving a chance to the negotiations. If the negotiations uh, between the different parties succeed, then we'll advance the reforms with more consensus. It doesn't need to be 100% consensus. I don't think there's any constitution in the world that passed with 100% cons consensus. There's always some type of opposition. Uh, but we want to have some larger consensus. If it doesn't happen, then we've said very clearly that we'll continue the legislation uh, of the reforms, probably only after the budgets. Right now, we're dealing with uh, budgetary issues. Uh, and so uh, the budget is supposed to pass at the end of, uh, of May. And so that's a lot of energy that the whole Knesset is involved in. Uh, and probably only after that, we'll get back to the reforms and we'll be able to pass it with our regular majority. Unfortunately, it probably means that they'll keep on threatening and they'll keep on using those tactics and crossing every single red line that can be crossed. By the way, one red line that's probably very close to your hearts also is the disinformation, not only to leaders of other countries, but also to the Jewish world, to the Jewish organizations. I mean, I know in ZOA, you guys don't fall for these things. But many other Jewish organizations have, uh, have fallen for these things, and they actually believe that if these reforms pass, Israel will not be a democracy. Now, it's completely ridiculous. Anyone who knows those reforms knows that, again, I can understand why someone might be for it, against it. In every country, there are people that are more for judicial activism, some people that are more for judicial restraint. It's a very legitimate argument. But to say that Israel will not be a democracy anymore when all we're doing is adopting the standards that exist in almost every democracy in the world is completely ridiculous. And yet this campaign of disinformation has been also targeting Jewish organizations in America. So this is another opportunity for me to thank ZOA for standing strong and not falling for that uh, campaign of disinformation. Now, why is it important to uh, understand this tension and this division? Because what happens very often is that when our enemies see an opportunity, they jump on it. And that, I think, is what we have seen. Not only I think, I have good reason to believe. It's what we've seen in the last few months uh, here in Israel. The last wave of terror, as I said, they used the Ramadan as an excuse. They used uh, the, 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 this person who committed suicide through hunger strike as another excuse. What they are really seeing is they're perceiving weakness because they're seeing all of these divisions within Israeli society. They're seeing soldiers, sorry, very highly ranked soldiers threatening refusal. They're seeing previous uh, chief of staffs of the Israeli armies, chief generals, Ramat Kalim, the, the former heads of the Israeli armies, calling for uh, uh, a civil uprising. It's something which is completely ridiculous. And when they see that, they perceive it as weakness. And when they see weakness, this emboldens them, right? Some people think that uh, what stops terrorism is when you're very nice to the terrorists, when you, get, when you compromise with them, when you give them a lot of the things that you have in your possession. That's never been the case. What stops terrorism is Israel being strong. If we are strong, they won't attack us. And now they're perceiving weakness. <laughs> and since they're perceiving weakness, uh, they're attacking us. But I want to say one thing very, very clearly. They're perceiving weakness, but they're wrong. Israel is very, very strong. Even with all of this discussion going on right now in Israel, and even if it looks maybe bad, at the end of the day, Israel is very strong. Israel is very united. Yes, it might sound weird to say, but I can tell you for that I, I'm convinced. Israel is very united. The people that are threatening to refuse orders are a small, small, small minority. The people that Yair Lapid uh, is uh, caving into, uh, instead of being the centrist that he claimed to be, he's caving into the most extreme parts of his bloc. But they're a small minority. And the proof of that, by the way, are the latest polls, where Yair Lapid is basically almost disappearing. Not yet, but he's going much, much, much lower. 
And Benny Gantz, who I might disagree with, uh, he's definitely not the head of my party, but he took another path. He took a path where he said that I disagree, but I'm not going to go around the world and speak against Israel. I disagree, but I'm not going to call for refusals. And so he took another path. And we can see that people, voters are moving from Yair Lapid uh, to uh, Benny Gantz. And that just should show us that even though our enemies perceive us as weak and they think they have an opportunity, there's no such opportunity. We're very strong. We're very united. When it comes to the important things, such as our security, such as Israel's existence, such as the army, then we've always been united and we're still united and that isn't going to change. Now, I promised also to speak a little bit about Iran. Iran has always been the number one ex existential threat to Israel. And that's still the case today. All of the other threats that Israel has are important threats. I don't want to minimize them. Uh, they're important threats. They can hurt Israel very badly, and therefore we have to be strong against them in order for us not to allow them to hurt us. But they're not existential. Iran can be an existential threat, both because of its, uh, its influence uh, around uh, uh, in other countries, and also if it uh, is able to get a nuclear weapon. That would be an exist existential threat to Israel. And therefore, Israel has always said, and we're still saying this today, that if the world will not help us stop Iran through sanctions, through diplomatic pressure, in every other way that's, that, needs to, that it needs to be stopped, then Israel will have to stand up and defend itself. Because we cannot allow a situation where Iran has a nuclear weapon this, again, will be an existential threat. This will change uh, Israel's standing overnight, uh, strategic standing overnight, because a nuclear weapon that threatens Israel, even before it's used, and hopefully it will never be used, hopefully it will never exist, but even without being used, the very existence of such a new nuclear weapon changes the standing that Israel has uh, in the world, and therefore we cannot let it happen. It will not happen. We will do everything that's needed in order to ensure that it will not happen. Another thing about Iran that we need to know is that while Iran in the past has called many times for, uh, for Israel to be destroyed, it called many times for uh, attacking Israel. It called Israel the small Satan in America, the great Satan, as you know. Many times it had some very bad uh, statements and it also sponsored a lot of terrorism. Its actions were usually uh, less aggressive. It, it talked a lot. It did a lot in funding, but it didn't do a lot when it came to actual actions against Israel. We've seen trends right now uh, that this seems to be changing. And this isn't good news for us. And I think it's for the same reason that I said before. Uh, it, Iran, again, it's not, it's not right. Uh, Iran is wrong believing this, but Iran sees Israel and the situation right now, and it's emboldened by the fact that it thinks that uh, Israel is weakened, and therefore it's investing much more in uh, trying to incite terror uh, in, uh, through Gaza, through Lebanon also, in Judea and Samaria, uh, in all of these areas, it's actually investing in using social media to incite terror, the same way other countries do for misinformation, but it's using it in order to incite terror. It actually has teams uh, using social media in order to incite terror. It's also placing a lot of soldiers uh, in uh, Syria, trying to place, we're doing a good job uh, pushing them back, but it's trying to place soldiers also in Syria in order to try to get closer to the Israeli border. And we see this trend of Iran not just talking the talk, but also trying to walk the walk. Now, I'm confident that Israel is strong enough to defend itself. I'm also confident that we will very quickly uh, rehabilitate our deterrent factor uh, and show the world that all of this talk about Israel being weaker right now and being divided, it's true that we have very strong arguments, but on the issues of security, defense, uh, defending the state of Israel, we're very united. And it's only a small minority that has gone 
uh, off the rails. <coughs> and as soon as we'll reiterate that, then our uh, standing will get back. The deterrent factor of Israel will come back. Uh, and I believe that Iran will be deterred again when it comes to that aggressiveness. When it comes to the nuclear program, they're, they're continuing their nuclear program. And I hope, I truly hope that the world will wake up and see uh, that right now, Iran, I mean, every day that passes and when we see the alliances that Iran does around the world, it's very clear that Iran is not on the side of freedom-loving countries. Iran is on the side of tyrannical regimes. Uh, and it's very clear also when you look at the way they uh, deal with their own citizens. When you had uh, protests in Iran, the way they were dealt with aren't the way that freedom-loving countries deal with protests. I mean, that's clear for everyone. Giving that regime a nuclear weapon is an exist existential threat to Israel, but it, not only to Israel, it's a threat to our very way of life. It's a threat to the free world, giving ayatollahs who aren't rational actors, but are completely insane. And we never know how they can use those nuclear weapons is a threat to the very existence of the free world, is a threat to the very society that we live in. And I hope the free world will wake up, not leave Israel alone. Even if they leave us alone, we'll know how to deal with it, but it will be much harder. And I hope they'll wake up and create a front against Iran. Maybe there's still time to do it diplomatically through sanctions, through very hard sanctions. They have to be hard. But even if it's not, then Israel shouldn't be left alone in order to deal with that uh, problem militarily. And the military option has to always be on the table. Uh, I want to say and uh, with one thing that's optimistic. I mean, we, we've spoken about how Iran is horrible to the free world. Uh, I'll uh, be a little bit more precise and I'll say that I'm talking about the Iranian uh, regime. I actually met uh, someone which I think was in touch also with ZOA, although I'm not sure. Uh, he was in Israel in, uh, in, uh, on Yom HaShoah. I'm talking about the son of the previous Shah in Iran, uh, who's the, the a leader in exile right now, who's trying to fight up until today, even though he is getting a lot of death threats, fight against the current uh, Ayatollah regime. He came to Israel, said that the Iranian people are not represented by the Ayatollahs, and he is confident that if that regime is overthrown, then the people of Iran and the people of Israel will be able to have some very deep and peaceful relations that remind me, to be honest, of the deep and peaceful relationships that we have nowadays with the Emirates, with Bahrain, with Morocco, and with other countries that we thought it was impossible to make peace with. But now we have peace with them. And so it's also possible that if that regime that is so problematic and so dangerous to Israel and to the free world uh, will stop existing, and we'll have some type of other regime, hopefully democratic, but some other regime in Iran, then hopefully we'll be able to turn the page on this horrible regime, both for the people of Iran who are under tyranny right now and for the free world. And so there is hope. I don't know how uh, realistic it is at this point. And so we have to be ready to defend ourselves against strategic threats. But I also want to put in that grain of, uh, of hope. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Dan. Um, before we get to questions, Mort, I'm sure you have a question or two or thoughts you'd like to share with Dan and the group. Yes, thank you, Alan. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Mr. MK, Dan Luz. First of all, that was a brilliant explication of the issues. Brilliant. Every Jew should hear what you just said. In fact, everyone in the world should hear what you just said. So clear, so precise, so straightforward, so understandable. Uh, I might add, uh, the government of Israel was elected overwhelmingly by 64 to 46. If you exclude the Arab parties, the Jews overwhelmingly voted for this, uh, this government. <clears throat> Remember, Israel is a Jewish state. Uh, it is not a little America. It's a Jewish state by and for Jews. <laughs> um, I, I have a couple of quick questions. One, could you give all of us an example or two where the Supreme Court overrode a law the Knesset passed and said it's not reasonable and ignored it. 
that people don't understand uh, the, the gravity of the situation where they ignore what is passed by the Knesset. Could you give us an example or two? And second, the law of return. That's one of the issues to change, to eliminate the, the, the rule that if you have one grandparent is Jewish, you can automatically become a citizen of Israel. Because one grandparent means the people who have only one grandparent have really no connection to Judaism, don't feel they're Jewish. Only 13% of the people who come to Israel under that law of return, uh, where there's one grandparent is Jewish, only 13% convert to Judaism. They're not interested in Judaism. And, uh, and because of that, last year, more non-Jews emigrated to Israel, made Aliyah than Jews. More non-Jews than Jews. That's why it's so important to change this. Could you tell us the status of this really can be uh, uh, happen? And, and the final thing is, why doesn't Israeli leaders, Bibi and the rest, make a big issue out of the fact that the Palestinian Authority has this monstrous Nazi-like policy to pay Arabs to murder Jews? If the world knew this, they would lose, the, the Palestinian Arabs would lose a lot of sympathy if they have. People don't know they pay Arabs to murder Jews, spending 400 million a year. Why doesn't the Israeli government say this in every single interview? I've said enough. Thank you very, very much. And by the way, regards to Amir Ohana for us. Thank you. I definitely will send my regards. Uh, I, I thank you for your questions. I'll answer one by one. I'll give one example uh, about a court case that passed. There's many. There's, I'll give two examples. Uh, one of them has to do with something which is very dear to ZOA and to me personally, as you know. It was called the regulation law. It doesn't sound good in English, so I'll explain what it meant. Uh, there are villages in Judea and Samaria, what people call settlements, right? Uh, that were uh, that were encouraged by the government, uh, but that the government never actually uh, did the bureaucratic process in order to make them legal. So they sent people there without actually making the process. Uh, and many of the left went to the courts in order to get these uh, villages evacuated, ex people expelled from their homes, even though they were sent by the government uh, many times. And so uh, the, a law was passed when we saw this trend happening over and over again, and people actually getting kicked out of their homes. Uh, a law was passed uh, in order to apply. The, the claim usually was that these villages uh, sat on uh, private land and, and they therefore couldn't be made legal. Uh, the reason why, I'm just getting into a little bit of legal details because it's important in order to understand the, 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 the situation. The reason why is because there's a different law that is currently applied in Judea and Samaria uh, and in the rest of Israel. Judea and Samaria was liberated in 1967. And ever since 1967 is under military rule, where we basically continue to apply Jordanian uh, and Turkish law. If you ask me, this is absolutely horrible. I hope we'll change that very quickly by applying sovereignty, but that's not our discussion right now. Uh, right now, Jordanian and Turkish law are still applied there. What that law that uh, was uh, proposed by, the, by Smotrich actually back then, uh, he wasn't a minister back then. He proposed the law was that uh, the law that applies in all of the rest of Israel when it comes to uh, the legal concept of, I think it's called prescription. I haven't been a lawyer for a long time, so I forgot my, my terms. But what it basically means is that there's a legal concept that says that if you, in good faith, uh, believe that something is in your property, use it as your property, and no one opposes you for a certain number of years, uh, I think it's seven years in Israel, uh, then that person that actually owns the property and you took it in good faith, right? You thought you bought it from someone who said it was his, for example, and you did all the due process and it was a real mistake by good faith. Then the law says uh, that you get to keep the property and the other guy can get some sort of compensation and because it might be his property really. So we wanted to apply that also to Judea and Samaria, something that's really reasonable. The courts canceled that. Another example has to do with illegal immigration. There is a, there was, to be honest, we, we were able to deal with most of the problem, but there was a very, very big problem in Israel with a lot of African migrants uh, that came to Israel, uh, claimed to be refugees, but had no proof for it. And it was clear to most people that they came in order to get jobs. I mean, it's very hard in Africa economically 
I don't wish anyone to have this uh, way of life, to be honest. I hope Africa can have huge economic development, and I really hope that everyone can live uh, happy lives. That's not the point, though. The point is that Israel is allowed to have an immigration policy like every single other country has an immigration policy. In Israel, it's even more important because we're a Jewish state. So we have demographic reasons why we want to keep the Jewish majority in Israel. Uh, and so we passed a law in order to deter uh, migrants coming from Africa uh, who came for jobs. How do we do that? By keeping uh, their salaries in a separate account, uh, putting them in detention uh, if they were caught uh, during their illegal uh, immigration. And there were a few steps that were there. Things that are actually accepted in the free world as ways to deal with illegal immigration. The courts canceled that based on the fact that this wasn't uh, respectful uh, to human nature, basically. Uh, again, something that's really hurting the fact that a government can decide on immigration policy, the way that governments decide on immigration policy everywhere around the world. And many times we see this trend, and that brings me back to my comments uh, earlier on. We see this trend that it's people who like policies that weren't able to pass the test of the elections that end up having a lot of influence in the courts and stopping the policies that the right wants. That's the trend usually. So yeah, I gave two examples. The second question you asked uh, was about uh, the law of return. Uh, I can tell you that right now, uh, what's being planned, I mean, you're right that there is some sort of, uh, of loophole in the current law of return uh, that I think there's wide agreement in Israel that it needs to be fixed. The exact way of how to fix it uh, is being discussed. Uh, they're establishing a committee in order to discuss it. Uh, and I believe that uh, we'll get to conclusions in the next uh, few months uh, or year or so. Remember, we have a four years of a right-wing government. And uh, by the way, I want to tell everyone that uh, is afraid that this coalition will fall that it's not happening. Uh, not anytime soon, at least. There's sometimes tensions within coalitions, but the coalition that, that exists right now is very uniform ideologically. Uh, we believe in the same things. And we understand that any other alternative is less good than the current coalition. And so this coalition, coalition will survive long term, hopefully the full four years, if not four years, uh, then, uh, uh, then close to four years. Uh, usually governments in Israel don't last until the very last minute. So it will be close to four years. Uh, but uh, we have to remember that we want to do a lot of good things for Israel. We can't do everything at the same time. And so some things are in discussion right now uh, in order for us to be able to deal with the reform. Right now, we're dealing with the actual budget, which is critical to pass, because if the budget doesn't pass, that's actually the only way that this government can fall. A budget that doesn't pass makes the government fall automatically. That's why we're putting all our energies right now in the budget that needs to pass until the end of May. And then we'll get to the other issues uh, in order to see how to deal with them. But I don't have any specific uh, update on that, but I can tell you that it is being discussed and they're, they're establishing a committee to discuss it uh, more in details. Uh, the last question uh, is a very good question. I can tell you that I'm very involved uh, in uh, diplomatic efforts uh, here in Israel as a parliament member in, uh, in the parliament to parliament relations. Uh, I plan to even come to uh, the States hopefully to do that in Congress, but I've already done that uh, in many places uh, around the world. Uh, and uh, I'm part even of the IPU, the International Parliamentary Union, which basically brings parliament members from all around the world. Uh, and one of the things that I always say to every parliament member is exactly that. So I completely identify and agree with you. I can't speak to other people why they don't emphasize this more, but I agree with you. I think that people are shocked. Uh, at the end of the day, even people that are pro-Palestinian, uh, when you speak uh, to them about this, they don't have any answer. And when you speak to them also about other things that the Palestinians do that are completely against their very own beliefs, a lot of people that are very strong believers in gay rights end up being very strongly pro-Palestinian because they believe that this is what the left should do. All around the world, there's this huge, ridiculous uh, coalition between 
uh, promoters of gay rights and uh, Palestinians, pro-Palestinian people, if they knew what gay people have to go through in Palestine, uh, under the Palestinian Authority, uh, they would not like the Palestinian Authority. That's for sure. And definitely not the Hamas, which is even worse when it comes to these things. If they knew how in Israel, that maybe there's some people that uh, uh, that are more religious that don't, that that for some religious reason don't approve of gay. But when it comes to civil liberties, <laughs> the, 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 the gay rights are complete here in Israel. They have full civil liberties, and yet you have this coalition, which is absolutely ridiculous. And so I completely agree with you. These are things that we should really uh, point out in order to show how their very logic, I'm not even talking about our logic, their very logic doesn't stand. It just doesn't stand. You're, you're supporting the people who are encouraging murders of Jews. You're supporting people who are going against your very ideology. And so it doesn't make any sense. And I completely agree with you. I use these arguments and I hope more people would. Thank you. Okay, uh, before we move on, Dan, um, MK Aluz, uh, this last half hour reminded me of my week in Israel where I learned so much in such a short time. Thank you for everything that you just shared with us, an incredible learning experience. Um, and for those who are listening, uh, one shameless plug that we are going to Israel and we're hoping, Dan, that you will host us in a day at the Knesset. So I'm glad to see you shaking your head. That's exciting. I will, I will. I know, I know. Uh, and I just wanted, before we go into Q&A, uh, only ZNA, only from ZNA, ZOA, will you have the benefit in the same program to get a detailed look into unvarnished truth of Israel through the lens of an up and coming superstar blended with the experience and wisdom of, uh, of a man recognized to be among the most knowledgeable and influential Zionists of our time. I've seen both of these men in action. Please, those of you on the call, help ZOA continue doing our work with Dan and his amazing cohort of young conservative colleagues. Support our work with a generous con contribution. If you've already given, please consider giving again. Join a donor society or move up to the next society level. Email or call me, Jackie. Please put my phone number and my email in the uh, chat and we can discuss your next contribution. Uh, two things on the on the agenda. We have the Celebrate Israel Parade on June 4th. Please march with ZOA. And again, we do have the upcoming uh, ZOA leadership mission to Israel. There are still open slots. If you call me soon this week, we can probably still get you in. So, Dan, I'm going to distill a couple of questions because we're running out of time. <clears throat> the first one I think that I'd like to ask is uh, House Speaker McCarthy was just in Israel. He brought a contingent, a non, uh, bipartisan contingent together with him. There were some issues that he addressed. I'd like to know what, and our, our viewers would like to know, what is the feeling on the street, first of all, uh, in Israel about the reliability of the US administration? That's one part of the question. Uh, were all members of the Knesset there to hear the speaker speak? Did the Arab contingents come? And if you could just comment on that for, for a few minutes. So first of all, uh, Speaker McCarthy uh, gave an absolutely incredible speech. Uh, I really recommend uh, everyone to listen to that speech. Uh, it was inspiring. Uh, it was, uh, honestly, I was sitting there and I was hoping, I was telling myself, I wish, uh, I wish all the Jews spoke this way, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, it was an absolutely amazing experience to sit down. It's the second speaker in the history uh, of Israel to come and address the Knesset. So it's also a historical moment. Uh, and it was very special. The Arabs uh, boycotted uh, the speech. The Arab parties boycotted the speech. Uh, they weren't present. I think it says a lot about uh, how uh, patriotic they are. Our most important ally comes and speaks and you decide to boycott. Obviously, you don't like the fact that there are our most important ally. Obviously, you're not being very patriotic. And that goes to uh, what uh, uh, Mort said beforehand, uh, when he said that uh, the majority of Jews uh, voted for, uh, for the right-wing coalition by a large majority. It's not only a question about being uh, Jewish or not by uh, lineage. It's also a question about the Arab parties are not just not Jewish. The Arab parties are anti-Zionists. The Arab parties often support terrorism. 
terror actions. Uh, and so we need to understand that. And by the way, not all Arabs vote for the Arab parties. That's also important to say that. Uh, a lot of Arab Arabs vote for Likud. We have voters, we have members of the Likud that are Arab uh, in our party, in our, in our uh, membership, in our party membership. Uh, and uh, that's the same to, uh, for all the other Zionist parties. Uh, but the Arab parties specifically are very problematic. They're anti-Zionist and they don't have Israel's best interest at heart. Uh, and they boycotted the, the speech. Uh, I, again, I was very moved by the speech. I was very moved by the fact that uh, it was a bipartisan uh, mission. I won't, I won't uh, hide a certain fact. There are elements in the Democratic Party that uh, worry me very deeply. I think they worry all of us. Uh, their growing influence worries me. Uh, again, worries a lot of Israelis. I do believe that Biden historically uh, has always been a friend of Israel. I think that he has uh, made a statement, which I, again, I, I, I don't know who uh, follows. Uh, I went out against that statement. Uh, I think it was out of line, but he very quickly retracted that statement. And I think we have to give him uh, credit for that, for uh, coming back and uh, going back to the, uh, at least the basic pro-Israel uh, uh, line. And so personally, I think that Biden might, has the right intentions. Obviously, I have disagreements with him when it comes to Judea and Samaria, disagreements when it comes to how aggressive we need to be with Iran, the Iran deal, I have very, very strong disagreements with him, yes? Uh, but overall, he's been over the years a friend of Israel. The problem isn't there. The problem is with uh, how much influence uh, the fringe groups are getting within the Democratic Party. I like being an optimist, if you guys didn't realize already. And I can say that in the past midterms and the past few elections, uh, we've seen that the fringe groups have actually lost some steam and not gain some steam. And so I want to be optimistic, but it's definitely something uh, that can be threatening to the bipartisan support of Israel that has always existed in America, not because uh, Israel uh, is uh, good looking, <laughs> but rather because of the very deep values that unite us, the values of freedom, the values of democracy, uh, the Judeo-Christian values, all of these values that unite us, uh, that unite the American uh, community, uh, the American population, the Israeli population, these are the values that bind the two nations. These values are still existing. So I believe that this connection will exist in the long term. The only threat to it is fringe uh, groups, uh, especially within the Democratic Party. If they gain influence, that can be very dangerous. And I have to thank, again, ZOA. I know you guys do a lot of work against this fringe group. While, again, while uh, supporting people on both uh, sides of the aisle that speak the right things, I, I, had, a, I had a meeting with uh, Senator uh, Menendez uh, on an issue that has to do with uh, regional cooperation between Israel, uh, Cyprus, and, and Greece. And Menendez was actually leading the call. He's an incredible friend of Israel, and he's part of the Democratic Party, but he's an incredible friend of Israel. So we still have uh, these, uh, and we need to really uh, strengthen the bipartisan support uh, of Israel uh, and try to make sure these fringe groups stay in the fringes. Dan, thank you for that. I, I'd like to get in two more questions and then ask more to, to close with you, but um, so I hope you can hang in for just a few more minutes. Uh, ZOA supported Gary Schottenstein. Gary, forgive me, I'm going to distill this a little bit. Though he doesn't think that it has the chance for success, he recommends that Israel propose to Iran that they need to discuss a peace treaty so that it has the good optic in internationally. Uh, in February, our good friend, who you know very well, Brigadier General Amir Avivi, was here and talked to us about um, the role of Saudi Arabia uh, in the complex that is the Middle East. And then the news breaks that China brokers some detente. Can you speak to that? A few things. One, uh, is that a real is that a real detente? Is there real um, synergy between those three countries? Will it have longevity? And how that impact some of the conversation that you just had about is Iran and Israel eventually one day, hopefully, uh, organizing a relationship? So uh, the connection 
between uh, Saudi Arabia uh, and Iran, I think is more a question of optics than any reality. But the real issue that's happening right now is that Saudi Arabia, and I'm not justifying or not justifying, right? Uh, but Saudi Arabia feels that America hasn't been on its side in the last few years. Uh, and it feels that it needs to realign its strategic interests. And it sees the growing strength of China and therefore decides to try uh, and reassess its strategic uh, its strategies and uh, maybe uh, get closer to China and not America. Uh, and that, that's really the, 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 the gist of it. Uh, the relationship between Iran and Saudi Arabia uh, has never been a good relationship. Uh, it's not uh, a, a, a secret that Shis and Sunnis do not like each other. It's not a secret that Arabs and Persians do not like each other. Uh, and so I, there's no deep love over there. There's something that's mostly, I think, technical, that's more about aligning itself with China rather than anything that has to do with Iran or Israel. And I believe uh, that the possibility for uh, peace between Saudi Arabia and Israel is still very real. It's still uh, a, uh, a very real goal that Israel put, that the Israeli government as a whole put to, for itself. Uh, it's something that we hope will happen. It depends on two things. It depends on a strong Israel because we've proven in the past that countries make peace with us when we're strong. Not when we are weak and concede and things like that, but rather they want peace from strength. And the second thing that's very important is a strong America because uh, the Abraham Accords happened not only because of a strong Israel, but also of a strong America that backed the deals and that uh, gave its blessing to the deals and that gave also the White House lawn for the signing of the deals. And, and so it depends on these two things. I'm still very hopeful that it can happen. Again, we have four years of a government, so not everything will happen in the first few months. We have to take time. Uh, things will happen slowly sometimes. Uh, definitely in the diplomatic world, things happen slowly and those processes take time. Uh, but I still believe, I can tell you that I am uh, the chair of the Abraham, Abraham Accords Caucus here in Israel that is trying to not only deepen uh, the current existing Abraham Accords, but also widen them and bring more countries into the fold. And again, it's no secret. Uh, the prime minister says it many times. So it's not something secret that I'm revealing to you. We hope Saudi Arabia will join the fold and we hope there will be peace with Saudi Arabia. I do not believe that this realignment that they're having right now uh, will uh, influence that. I'll be honest, I don't even, I'm not even sure that it's a real realignment or whether it's, a try, it's something that they're trying to do in order to better negotiate uh, with America. Uh, on getting more support and things like that. It's unclear how even the realignment to China is real. So the, 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 the connection to, uh, to uh, Iran to me is not something that I'm, uh, that I'm really threatened with. It's not something positive. I don't want to also lie, right? I don't think it's something positive, but it's not something that makes me very worried. But that's about the, the second question. About the first question, I have to say that I understand the optics of us calling for negotiation. I personally disagree. Uh, I think that uh, when a country calls for your destruction, they want to make a genocide of the Jewish people uh, in Israel. Uh, you don't go out and negotiate with these people. I mean, I wouldn't have negotiated with the Nazis. I don't usually compare many people to Nazis, to be honest. But when someone calls for the destruction of the Jewish people, that's, that's basically the ideology that they're talking about. And you don't go out and negotiate with them. Furthermore, they're also Islamic extremists. They're not rational actors. They've lied in the past. We've proven that things that they've agreed to, they haven't actually upheld. Uh, and so I don't, I don't agree. I don't think that uh, negotiations is the right way to go. Even a call for negotiations, I think, uh, is not the right way to go, even though I respect the opinion and I, I understand the logic of the optics and of how it looks. But there are, there are times where uh, actually looking strong is better than looking nice. Uh, and I'm not interested in looking nice when it comes to Iran. I want to look strong. Okay. Uh, 
For those on the call, uh, MK Luz had asked us to be very mindful of the one o'clock hour. Mort, would you like to have uh, some final comments? <laughs> Uh, MK Dana Luz, I have to tell you, this was <clears throat> the greatest job interview I've ever had. If you want to come back to ZOA, <clears throat> you're more than welcome. Uh, you were just sensational. I, really, I, I, I was overwhelmed with how, how extraordinarily insightful, factual, and principled you are on these issues. Uh, by the way, you should know, uh, we should all remember Menachem Begin used to say publicly that officials in Israel should not come to America or any other country and criticize Israel outside of the country. So uh, what uh, Lapid is doing is totally against what Begin and most other people uh, uh, reject. <laughs> I might add, when I, um, as many may know, I met with Reverend Al Sharpton this week. When I told him about the fact that the, the Palestinian Authority pays people to murder Jews, that they name school streets and sports teams after Jew killers, that their emblem shows all of Israel as Palestine with a picture of Arafat. He was in such shock. He said he never heard this, he said he speaks to Jewish leaders. He speaks to Greenblatt of ADL. Why hasn't anyone ever told him this? This is horrible. He said, how can we support the Palestinian Authority, the Palestinians, if this is the way they're acting? He didn't know. And he said, I'm gonna be speaking to Hakeem Jeffries, the minority leader of the Democratic Party uh, 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 in the next day or two about this and the Black Caucus to see what we uh, have to do uh, about this. So, uh, uh, and after this uh, meeting with uh, uh, so many good people on the line and the, the work that you're doing, uh, I have to say, I, maybe I speak for everyone. Uh, I sleep a little bit better at night knowing that MK Dana Luz is in a position of uh, responsibility and authority uh, in the Israeli uh, Knesset. So thank you so much for being with us, uh, MK Luz. We look very much forward to having you on regularly as your time allows. And uh, we look forward to seeing you in Eretz Israel. Thank you so much, Mori. It was an honor. And this will end our webinar. Thank you all for attending.